the go podcast what can we learn from veterinary medicine for ortho generation professor lisa fourier from the cornell university of veterinary medicine discusses together with dr yari Daman, amsterdam university medical center's university of amsterdam why regenerative medicine should be a first line of treatment my name is Takao Shima, and this is On The Go, the podcast all around author generation. So we welcome uh, Dr. Lisa Fordier um, to our On The Go podcast. And um, we are really, um, really happy to have you uh, on the podcast, on the On The Go podcast. And we will be um, going into the future together with you. But before we can do that, we need to get to know you a little bit uh, better. Obviously, a lot of our listeners already know you. But uh, we also want to know some insights into who you are. So we always start with the same question, and that is, how do you drink your coffee? <laughs> how often, question. how much? <laughs> uh, coffee is definitely the way I start my day. I'm a pretty much a snob for a well-roasted skim milk latte. Uh, I usually have two of them, and my favorite way to enjoy it is walking around in the morning, especially in the spring, to see what has grown, how many chipmunks have destroyed my yard, uh, what slugs are coming out. Like, I just think nature is amazing. So that, that's my favorite way to start my day is a hot skim milk latte outside enjoying nature. All righty. And is there a, is there a sneaky coffee uh, in after 4 p.m. as well? Or are you a, uh, do you stop after 4? <laughs> uh, I, I stop by noon. I, I seem to be a little bit sensitive to caffeine after noon, and I tend to head towards the wine by, not by four, but <laughs> <laughs> my, <laughs> my evening drink is a nice glass of Sauvignon Blanc at night. Uh, but I usually don't drink much coffee past noon. All righty. And if you could say one favorite place to drink your morning coffee, how, where would you describe that? Yeah, I suggested that a little bit earlier, just outside in the garden. If it's, you know, I live in Ithaca, New York, so that's only possible for four or five months out of the year. So the rest of the time, it's somewhere in my home, not ready for work yet, just putzing around the house. All righty, all righty. Uh, a little bit later on in the, in the podcast, uh, thank you for your answers. We will uh, we will also get into um, um, some um, some more in between your questions. So. Um, we will be waiting for that with uh, with joy, but uh, we'll uh, we'll be heading into the um, to the main questions uh, for today, and um, uh, obviously um, a lot of orthopedic surgeons, clinicians, and researchers in the orthopedic regenerative field are listening to the to this podcast. Um, but we also want to know from you what can we learn from vet medicine and research, and from your perspective of uh, yeah of, of that world, what can we learn from from you? In, in regenerative medicine specifically, I think the yeah. biggest things that we've learned in the past 10, 20, even 30 years that we've been looking at things like platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow concentrate, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein, I think the biggest thing to learn from all of those is it should be your first line of treatment. None of these things are magic bullets. Uh, many people wait until steroids have failed, HA have failed physical therapy failed. And if we all remember that curve, right, you get the initial inflammation and then remodeling and all those things, like we really need to be at the forefront and the, at that initial injury. But then that also means we need to figure out how to get those patients to us that are administering, you know, primary care physicians are probably not going to be doing regenerative medicine therapy. So if you go to a primary medicine physician, and they diagnose something and send you to physical therapy and it doesn't work, which isn't a bad route, but if it doesn't work, you're already in the chronic phase. So figuring out how to uh, improve our diagnostics on both sides for human and animals, like how could we really determine a chronic tendinopathy from something that is acute on chronic? Uh, and I think that's, that's really the place where we're missing is it, figuring out how to figure out where we are in that healing cascade with our diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, just flying towards 2040, um, where do you think we are um, in that perspective and how do we get there? Uh, specifically on diagnostics is more, um, I think it's going to be a lot more on metabolic imaging. 
Uh, so PET scanning, for example, you know, it, it's routine now to do PET scanning in horses uh, at, at a few of the different facilities, but it gives you much more, uh, much more insight into the actual biology of the injury, not just where it is, like maybe your bone marrow edema isn't quite active at the time. So uh, metabolic imaging should be embraced earlier as well. All right, and is that is that something new for the uh, for fat medicine that 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 you've been doing um, PET scans in an early phase, or where has that come from? There's three or four facilities that are really doing PET scanning. Uh, Davis is a big leader. Uh, Wisconsin uh, started a lot of it as well. Uh, so it, it's not new, but it's really becoming much more acceptable and much more widespread. Okay, and and in what specific phase or in what indication should we apply um, those PET scans? What should we think of, especially also for for human beings? I, I think especially in humans, those knee cases that you get that have bone marrow edema, it, an MRI signal might say, "Oh, that is probably active," but you don't really know that, right? It's still it's still not really metabolic. So I think you know if you get an MRI scan that says you have bone marrow edema, or if you suspect that in a soccer player, uh, that would be a, a major indication. And and specifically um, concerning then the um, the early phase of being able to um, uh, be able to to develop and also apply some preventive uh, treatment options. What is currently being performed or or out there for fat medicine when you uh, apply an early PET scan? What um, when do you do A, when do you do B? I think the biggest thing that we can say for PET scanning in animals is back off exercise. Uh, I don't think in human or veterinary medicine, we know how, how to fix that bone marrow edema. We have ideas on how to bolster it to make sure that the subchondral bone and the cartilage don't get injured. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is just, you need a lot of rest to get that to heal. So mainly from a um, from a phase of maybe also some distraction therapy and some early injections in that phase, or is it only rest? Um, what's been doing? Uh, what's been going on right now in the field? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that depends on what's all affected. You know, if it if it looks like it's just bone, then it's probably just rest or maybe some of these uh, calcium phosphate injections. Again, I think the evidence is mounting, but it's not really there to say that's the gold standard. Uh, it, it, you know, certainly getting them to do non-weight bearing exercise uh, if you can, or back off of exercise and support bone health in general, testing you know, for vitamin D levels and B12 and other things that might be more important for the metabolism, overall metabolism of the patient. Mm -hmm. And um, Jen, then just going back again um, to, um, to the year of 2040, uh, do we think that together with um, um, with the PET-CT scan that we will be able to, uh, for example, aspirate some, some joint fluid and be able to analyze it in the lab and make a horse-specific or animal-specific cocktail of uh, chondroprotective factors? Or how, how do you think we are, we are in the, in, in the, where well, we are in the, in the year of 2040 with this? Oh, gosh, wouldn't that be nice if you could, you know, there's so many biomarkers, for lack of a better word, that we are still searching. And there's a lot of very elegant research that's going on looking at urine and blood and, uh, you know, and uh, joint fluid, as you said, you know, I've done a fair number of studies looking at joint fluid, and the ways that we typically look at it with white blood cell counts and those sorts of things don't tell you anything. You know, like after any surgery or any injection, you're going to get some inflammation and then it goes away, but it's not discerning enough to say, where are you on that scale of acute chronic remodeling heading towards osteoarthritis? Uh, so there are some markers, but I think as we learn more about osteoarthritis, especially, we know that it is, it is an immune mediated disease. So looking more at T helper cells and T17 secreting molecules from there. Christian Latterman is leading the way with IL-17 and IL-6. So uh, I think we will figure out, you know, where a patient is, but <laughs> it's going to be difficult too, because arthritis is a, it undulates, right? It's not a, it's an intermediate disease where one day you have a good day, then you have a bad day. 
Uh, so just because you don't have elevated IL-6 or 17 on a day doesn't mean you aren't somewhere on that pathway. So uh, figuring out the timing of those therapies is going to be really important too. But I think really looking at osteoarthritis as an immune mediated disease, I'm not saying it's rheumatoid arthritis, but we know that it has an immune component to it. Yeah, and, and I read some of the recent publications coming also from uh, from your group on the uh, anti-inflammatory uh, regulatory T cells, and and that one was was insightful. Um, related to that, do you think that we should, because um, also we have the immunologists in our uh, hospital, orthopedic surgeons and, and scientists, researchers, everything. Do you think we um, orthopedic surgeons should have some, in that sense, some basic um, immunological courses in order to develop that field a bit more? Or what's your standpoint on that? Yeah, I think that would be uh, quite critical. And you'll see you see it creeping into uh, orthopedic meetings, congresses more and more. You know, most people don't really listen enough. They start looking at their phone <laughs> uh, yeah. because they don't think it really applies to them. Because many people were taught that osteoarthritis is inflammation is not immune mediated you know too many people segregate rheumatoid from osteoarthritis and and there's a lot a lot of overlap so you know i think and the same can be said for osteochondral allografts you know people say well there's not an immune component to it but when a lot of us when we were taught in medical or veterinary school you think of inflammation as this giant big red throbbing painful pitting edema but uh, inflammation is much more subtle than that when you really look. So, you know, Bill Bugby has looked at the immune complex associated with osteochondral allograft, and there is an immune reaction. That doesn't mean it's bad, but uh, in some cases it is. And and so we're thinking, rethinking and a more nuanced way about Im immunology in orthopedics <laughs> is really, really needed. And, and going back uh, to the to the people that are on their phone during those conferences, and maybe they will be a bit bored, or when they see all these very difficult, complicated uh, pathophysiological mechanisms, um, do you have some some insight or some tips how we could uh, make that easy that, that information easier to grasp and easier to to learn for for us as uh, researchers or or speak surgeons in training or in that sense. How can we make it more sexy? <laughs> That's a great question. I find that, uh, especially when I give grand rounds, the residents that are there or even the attendings would say, we didn't learn any of this. And they are, people are starting to learn more of it in undergraduate and medical school. Uh, but I think reminding, like, why is this important in this disease? So to put immunology within that one disease, instead of this is all of immunology, which is overwhelming. But let's pick again, osteochondral allografts. Now, how do you think about immunology? Osteoarthritis, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, what is the immunology associated with that? I think that would be a better way than doing just a fundamental uh, immunology boot camp. Mm -hmm. So we should really group it into, um, the, 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 uh, the put the diagnosis into groups of disease A, B, and C, and then um, try to learn from that, try to learn from those mechanisms instead of having all the information out there. Is that something that you're suggesting? I'm right. I would, I would think that would be more interesting to the orthopedic doctor and surgeon. I think that would hit home more to say, wow, I didn't think about how immunology is related to chronic rotator cuff or what happens after rotator cuff surgery or why, you know, Christian Latterman, again, why are some patients responders after ACL surgery and others aren't? Why does some go on to have chronic pain and, and develop arthritis faster and others don't? And as you know, he uh, did this really cool study showing that it's IL-6 in the cutoff. And we yeah. riffed off of that and went on to show, you know, the TH17 T helper cells. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that also brings us to to um because uh, apparently it's a part of um going into the future uh, the, an important part is um education so trying to uh, have the right education to the right people um but then going a bit more into the future research parts um what would you bet your money on for um for important um 
mediators or important uh, to help ourselves or uh, interleukins for the year of 2040 who are the the big three that you would uh, research or that will be important uh 2040s i didn't mean it seems a long ways away um uh, it uh, christian latterman's group again and kale jacobs had some really cool information at the recent academy meeting uh and there's so many molecules that we haven't discovered yet with omics. So I honestly think all bets are off. I think nothing that we know right now is the holy grail. Uh, I think through metabolomics and all the other studies that we can do with a defined population, which that group is trying to do, uh, I think we're going to discover molecules and pathways that we had never thought of, complement associated pathways. And, you know, we think of inflammation and neutrophils and T helper cells, but I think it's going to be something completely different. You think that um, in 17 years from now, a, a big um, discovery will be uh, will be done uh, in osteoarthritis or the cartilage related diseases when we look at these um, immunological pathways? I do. I think we're going to know uh, I think there's going to be genomic tests to say what, why is Lisa predisposed to this type of osteoarthritis? And therefore you can do interventions much earlier. The immunotherapies have really been a game changer and the next generation of immunotherapies will be more patient specific. So, you know, it, people are going to be afraid to do that. Who wants insurance companies and everybody else to know your genetic profile and your predisposition to diseases? So the technology is probably there already. It's just implementing it in a really safe way. And then you can really start to design patient specific diseases, but it'll be tough, right? You can imagine, uh, would you do it? Would you submit your DNA and then know that it's in your medical record? And what if somebody else requests your medical record? And it, it, it gets tricky. Yeah. It's all out there on the, on the streets. <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> Well, the, I think we have a lot of a lot of things to look forward to when we when we consider these um, uh, potential new pathways that we're going to discover. So that's that's going to be very interesting and um, for us as researchers as well. Um, then going a bit into a different topic because um, um, we now talked about the um, the fat medicine and also the the um, all the research that you did on OA and cartilage damage, um, but you're also involved. Um, um, of course, you were involved in the JCGP, and now you're uh, obviously very active in the, um, if I pronounce it correctly, the JEFMA. I don't know how you uh, use the abbreviation. That's correct. JEFMA. Is that a, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, how has your role been so far there? And could you tell us something about your path leading um, towards uh, the role that you currently have at JEFMA and where you came from, from the JCGP? Yeah, thank you. Uh, when I was president of the ICRS, uh, we started cartilage. Every mo Most societies have a journal. So we started cartilage, which was the paper journal. And the publisher there is Sage. And the ICRS really wasn't very successful in renegotiating our contract with Sage. There was just no way to really be able to do what we as the ICRS wanted to do with the journal. So we decided to, the ICRS leadership decided to start an online only journal, which is really the phase right now. Very not everybody reads in print anymore. So online only open access journal. Uh, and they asked me if I would be the editor in chief. And it was a fantastic opportunity. I really, really loved it. Uh, and I'm grateful for them to offer me the position. So I got to work with these amazing women at Elsevier and design it from the bottom up every, what was the manuscript category? What's the flow from uh, when you submit a manuscript, who are the associate editors, social media, the whole thing. It was really exciting. And uh, because we were having fun doing that, uh, and then COVID hit and we were all remote and the American Veterinary Medical Association, so like the American Medical Association, but for veterinarians, we have two scientific journals. One is JAVMA, as you said, and that's really meant for practitioners. And then we have AJVR, American Journal of Veterinary Research, obviously meant for researchers, given the name. And they asked me if I would then be considered being their editor in chief and division director of publications. And wow. as you know, I'm a veterinarian and I'm very proudly a veterinarian. It's been a, an amazing career. I, I couldn't think of it, a better career, honestly. Uh, no, no insult to the MDs, but I, I think my being a veterinarian is just a fabulous career. 
Uh, and the American Veterinary Medical Association represents, oh gosh, at least 90% of the veterinarians. And, and so it was a way for me to give back to my profession uh, and really think about how I can help through our publications, those practitioners better treat their animals. So it's just been an amazing career, but it all started really with uh, being allowed that opportunity at JCJP. And as you know, the fabulous Rachel Frank now is the editor in chief. So it's in good hands. It's definitely in good hands. And um, I think uh, through your role of JCJP, you were able to uh, move towards the, to JAFMA. Um, and obviously you, you started the, the JCJP. And I think um, with that as uh, having had a role of editor in chief for both journals, um, you are the, the right person to tell us as, as authors or give us some tips on the three most important tips for getting your work published in the um, in the um, uh, orthopedic regenerative field. Which three tips would you give us? It's <laughs> a great question. The first tip I would give would be to write a good cover letter. That's the first thing the editor-in-chief is going to read and decide to move your manuscript forward or to say, sorry, this doesn't fit within the scope of our journal or something like that. So I advise people to write, uh, here's what's known in the field, one or two sentences. Here's the knowledge gap, one or two sentences. Here's what our manuscript does to fill that knowledge gap, two to three sentences. And you know, in those two to three sentences, why this is clinically important. Most people in their cover letter, and I was guilty of this too for a long time, would write, Dear Dr. Editor-in-Chief, in close, please find our manuscript, blah, 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 blah. We confirm that it has not been published anywhere else. It's not under submission for anybody else. Thanks you, thank you for considering our manuscript. But that doesn't really tell me the nuanced, really cool parts of your manuscript. So I think that's a really important thing is to write a cover letter that hits the Editor-in-Chief over the head with why this is important contribution to the field. Why is it new? right? There's so many studies that the title reads like everything else. So you need to tell somebody before they have to digest the whole manuscript. The other thing, the hardest thing in publishing, I don't care if you're nature or science or JCJP or JAVMA, is finding reviewers. So in your cover letter, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but in your cover letter, if you can suggest six to 10 reviewers. Oh, that's a lot. It's a lot. But give them, like, I recommend Lisa Fortier, here's her email. You don't have to write down their whole affiliation. I'm not going to send them a paper invite. <laughs> uh, but you also need to pick people that are mid-career or interested in the field that are going to do the review, right? If you think of, you know, the top person in the field that might not have the time uh, to do the review or might be really tardy, but that 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 is the hardest thing in publishing is getting people that are qualified and actually will do the review. Sometimes you can invite 20 people yeah. and you get one or two responses. So, so that would be the second part. Uh, probably the, the other tip I would give people is to reach out to the editor. I get probably a dozen emails a day that say, I'm think here's one, here's one I got this morning. I have a retrospective study of 200 dogs uh, in two different treatment groups. I only have descriptive statistics, right? So that means they were just gonna report the median and the range, uh, but some people have discouraged me from doing other statistics. Would this be sufficient for your journal? So instead of them writing up the whole manuscript and submitting it to me, and I would say, sorry, descriptive statistics is probably not enough. I suggest you seek statistical consultation. So if you have an idea for a manuscript and you're not sure if it fits within the, uh, purview of the journal or if it's would be acceptable for them I really encourage people to reach out to the editor or one of the deputy editors will answer and that will save everybody a lot of time mm -hmm. okay those are three um, very practical tips that we can use and apply so that's 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 great to hear um um the one the one about the cover letter I, I haven't heard yet and I think it's good to that we should all uh, look for more peer reviewers that are in our field. And it will probably also um, speed up the process of finding the right ones also for the editors. Yeah, um, I, sorry, I was taught, uh, if you think about every manuscript that you submit, 
you're burdening, for lack of a better word, at least four or five people, right? The editor, one or two reviewers, and at least somebody in publishing. So at a minimum, if you are a good citizen in scholarly publishing, for every manuscript that you submit, you should be reviewing two manuscripts. So there you go. For, the, for, the, for the listeners, <laughs> see how much you publish and then do as twice as much. Also a tip to be a peer reviewer, I guess, then in that sense. Yes. Okay. Um, great tips. I think we're slowly heading towards the end of the podcast and um, we always end the podcast with, um, we start the podcast with some personal questions, but we also end the podcast with some personal questions. Um, and our first one is always the same. What is your guilty pleasure? My horse. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, nothing, you know, I don't ride him every day, but I certainly go out and uh, his name is Franklin. I call him Frankie and I'm like, hey, Frankie. And he gives me a big whinny and comes over. And sometimes I just pick his feet. Sometimes I just feed him carrots, but he's definitely my guilty pleasure. All right. That. What else will we have expected from a, <laughs> from a fat doctor? <laughs> Great. Um, and what do most people not know about you that is special? Hmm. Might be a difficult if one. Yeah, I think most people wouldn't know that I grew up uh, on a very small farm. I grew up in a large farm, but a very small farming community. I graduated with and from high school with 13 people, <laughs> and I was number three in the class. <laughs> <laughs> I never got above number three. Uh, but I think growing up in a farming community uh, really established my roots. You know, you, you, nobody's above a shovel. Uh, and working on the farm. So I think that's something people wouldn't know about me. All right, great to hear. And then and then our last one um, for all the listeners, we've already heard a lot of tips and advices, but um, just um, to end it off, what would be your golden advice or tip for upcoming researchers, clinicians, or students in both our fields? Collaborate, collaborate with immunologists, collaborate with physical therapists and get off of email, pick up the phone, or if you can walk down the hall, shake hands, go to meetings, talk to people, uh, but you can't do this alone. And all these fields are becoming integrated. So uh, really reaching out beyond orthopedics, beyond your division and collaborate with other people. All right, great advice. We'll walk uh, down the hallway and, and meet people live again after the COVID crisis okay. so that's that's good all right thank you so much for the um, for the podcast it was a uh, it was a pleasure discussing the future um, of oa the future of uh, fat medicine and also uh jaffma jcgp and all the advice that we got from you so um um thank you so much thank you for your time i had a great time reaching out beyond orthopedics and collaborate great advice from a veterinary perspective by lisa fourier Stay tuned for more content at my.on-foundation.org. Thank you for listening and have a great day.